Hello, and welcome to our talk about SSA-based register allocation for GPU architectures. With me is Connor. He's the creator of the IR3 register allocator, which is SSA-based and used by Freedreno and the Turnip driver. And I'm Daniel. I probably started all this hype about SSA-based register allocators um, when implementing it for the ACRO um, compiler used by the Radley driver. Before we jump into the register allocation stuff, let us quickly recap the, um, the SSA form. Whoa, OK, there we go. Um, SSA stands for single static assignment. and Instead of variables, we have the values, which are only defined once. You probably already know all this, but um, let us go over it anyway. So when a variable is written multiple times, we insert a so-called uh, fee node to produce a new value that is equal to either value, depending on which path the control takes. So the fee node um, isn't a real instruction as yeah, most computers don't have fee instructions, but it's very useful for all kinds of optimizations. And for that reason, the SSA form is used throughout the middle end by most modern compilers. Um, also note that here in this example, or also in general, each source of a fee node is associated with a predecessor block. Um, and each source is considered to be read at the end of the corresponding predecessor. So in this example, um, v10 is read at the end of the then branch, and v11 is read at the end of the else branch. Before a program can run on any hardware, the fee nodes have to be removed again. As I stated, they cannot be executed on the hardware. So the SSA deconstruction has to be performed, or also known as the SSA elimination. And it's traditionally performed before register allocate, uh, allocation by inserting copies on the control flow edges. So in um, these copies, which are then inserted, can sometimes be removed by the so-called coalescing pass. Then register allocation um, is the process of replacing these variables with, uh, with physical registers. As there can be an unbounded number of variables in a program, but only a limited number of physical registers, um, there usually must be multiple variables mapped to the same physical register. Um, but the assignments cannot conflict. So, for example, here we see that v1 and v2 cannot be assigned to the same physical register because the load to v2 would override the value of v1. And to be more precisely, we say that v1 is live during the definition of v2. Um, meaning that it will be used later here in this example by the add instruction below. If the register allocator cannot find a suitable allocation, then it might have to move some variables to memory and add load store instructions. Um, and this process is called spilling. We will get back to that later, but as you can already see here in this short example, it is possible to sign uh, to assign the variables in in different ways and not always are equally good. So this brings up the question, what is actually a good register allocation? Um, optimality in, in, in terms of register allocation is not only a question of feasibility, meaning that do we find um, allocation, um, but it's also a question of the quality of the generated code. And this question is highly hardware dependent. For example, are moves 
move instruction or copy instruction, are they cheap or expensive? Are spills to memory cheap or expensive? As there is definitely a trade-off between having more copy instructions uh, or more spill instructions, um, that is memory loads and stores. Or do we gain anything from using less registers or can we just as well use the whole register file um, without any drawbacks? And finally, there's also the question of, um, do we have to take care of read after write stores? Um, but um, yeah, this, is, this will not be part of our talk today. Um, let's have a look at traditional register location. Register location can be seen or has like for a long time been seen as a graph coloring problem where variables correspond to the nodes in, in the so-called interference graph and the physical registers are the colors. So two nodes in this graph share an edge if they cannot share a register. Um, that is, if they are live at the same time. And this approach shares the same problems uh, with general graph coloring. It is NP complete. It, even building the interference graph is comparably, comparably expensive. And for that reason, as a, yeah, basically as another heuristic, um, the so-called linear scan was invented. Um, we will cover the linear scan algorithm in more detail later, but the general idea is that in a single pass over the program, um, the registers are just assigned on the go. Um, as I mentioned before already, coalescing is the process of removing copy instructions, which have been inserted by the SSA deconstruction um, pass. So the traditional register locator does not insert any new copies in the program. And this means that copies which are removed before the register locator won't appear in the final program. And we say that coalescing and register location um, are decoupled or can be decoupled. And, but the process of removing copies makes it harder to estimate the number of registers which are needed um, for the program to execute. Up to the point that the register allocator um, must be able to insert spill code to proceed or is otherwise uh, cannot otherwise find a free register. If we look at SSA-based register allocation, um, this it, the algorithm is, for, for example, described in the paper Optimal Register Allocation for SSA Form Programs in Polynomial Time by Sebastian Hack and Gerhard Goes. And one thing to note directly is that the optimal in this paper refers to, um, to the minimum number of registers used. And this also requires some assumptions, which to which we will get back later. But it is not optimal in the sense that we discussed earlier. Um, yeah, just to, to keep that in mind also. We know that um, register allocation is NP-hard, so in general, you won't find an optimal solution in polynomial time unless you solve P equals NP. <laughs> um, the algorithm in this paper is an, an extension of the graph coloring algorithm. So what we will do in this talk is slightly different. Um, and it's called the tree scan algorithm, but the principle and ideas are um, the same. Um, yeah, the idea of SSA-based register allocation is pretty um, simple. We just assign registers to the fee nodes and deconstruct the SSA afterwards. So, um, but what are the implications of this idea? Yeah, first of all, um, coalescing is implicit. We may need to insert copies when deconstructing the SSA after register allocation, or we may not. And this entirely depends on how we assign registers to the fee nodes. Uh, the second implication is that on SSA, we can precisely calculate the number of registers we will need in the final program. 
And for that reason, we can handle spilling independently and before the register allocation. Um, note, already know that in order to be able to do that, um, even more copies might be, in, uh, might be necessary. Yeah, in addition to the ones from, from coalescing or from the phenols. So what about GPUs? Now that we know a bit about the advantages and disadvantages of SSA-based register allocation, is it a good fit for GPUs? Let's have a look. Um, GPUs rely on having many waves. These are, in, from hardware perspective, these are threads sharing the same memory and LU resources so that the latency of waiting on memory can be hidden by switching between the waves. And many GPUs partition the register file dynamically between waves. And this means that the more registers a program uses, the fewer waves can be active at once, and also called the occupancy, um, yeah, and creates a complex trade-off between the ability to hide latency in a single wave or to hide latency by switching between waves. And traditionally, the scheduler, which is running before the register allocator, has to make this trade-off, but has no way of knowing how many registers the register allocator will eventually need. So um, with SSA-based register allocation, we can know exactly how many registers um, a given program will need. And this will allow the scheduler to make better decisions. Um, to sum it up, we can conclude that on some GPU architectures, um, it is beneficial to use less registers. And also, on GPUs, memory bandwidth is typically much lower than the register file bandwidth. Also, the memory latency is much higher than of registers. And that means that any spilling uh, can quickly kill the performance. On the other hand, um, register to register copies are relatively cheap. And with traditional allocators, there's no guarantee it succeeds, succeeds without inserting spill code even if there are, in theory, enough registers available. So with SSA-based register allocation, we can do spilling upfront and avoid, or um, even avoid it unless it's absolutely necessary. And for these reasons, we decided to use SSA-based register allocation for our backends. And Connor will now explain to us the, the actual algorithm in all its beauty. OK. so. Now, now you've heard from Daniel about all the benefits of SSA-based register allocation, um, but now let's go, let's dive in and see how it actually works. All right, so to explain it, let's start with a very simple architecture, and later we're going to extend it to support branching and other more realistic things, um, but the core ideas that we're going to see will remain the same. Okay, so in the simple architecture, liveness is very straightforward. A value is just live whenever there's a use later in the program. Uh, however, since our algorithm is going to work top down for reasons that will be clear later when we go over the tree scan, um, we're going to need to know when a given use is the last use of a value. We say that this use kills the value because afterwards it's no longer live. Um, so we have these kill flags, as you can see here. Um, and another note, we have to be careful here when there are multiple uses of the same value. Um, real implementations like ECHO and IR3 keep track of the first kill of each value for each instruction uh, to simplify the core algorithm, but we're going to gloss over that here. All right. So for the actual allocator, um, we need to keep track of which physical registers are available and which are in use currently in use by a value. Um, uses happen before definition, so first we mark uh, killed uses as making their register available, and for then for each definition, we pick an available register and mark it as in use, and then we just do this over each instruction, going one instruction at a time. 
This algorithm is optimal in the sense that if there is a valid assignment, uh, it will find one. Specifically, it'll never fail as long as there are most n values live at the same time, where n, again, is the size of the register file. This is called the register pressure, and in ACO, the maximum register pressure is called the demand of the program. Um, um, it's important to note that this algorithm is actually a restatement of the linear scan that allocator that Daniel mentioned earlier. Uh, in the usual linear scan algorithm, we use a different data structure called the live range instead of the kill flags, uh, and we iterate over live ranges instead of instructions, but this formulation is going to be better suited for being extended to the tree scan algorithm. We'll see in a second. Okay, so now that we've got our basic register allocator, um, we're gonna extend it to handle control flow, which is the first major extension that we're gonna talk about. Um, so first off, for liveness, um, we're gonna use the classic data flow algorithm to find liveness. Um, it's described all over the internet, um, so I'm not gonna talk about it here, uh, but the result of the algorithm is the, a bunch of live in and live out sets for each block, uh, it's saying which values are live before the beginning and after the end of the block. And we're still, we're gonna assume that we still have uh, kill flags as before in addition to the live in and the live out sets. Um, so before we get to the actual algorithm, we're gonna need to understand, we need to go over a bit of theory to understand why it still works even when there's branching and multiple basic blocks. So in particular, we're gonna have to go over the notion of dominance. Um, in SSA, we typically require that each definition dominates its use, which, mean, which uh, allows that the value is always defined whenever the use of the value is reached. And when converting to SSA, we insert a special fake instruction called undef and extra fee notes when a register is only partially defined to keep that property. So we're gonna assume uh, throughout this that that's been the case. Okay, so an important fact about the dominance relation that I just showed you is that it forms a tree. That is uh, given a program organized into basic blocks. Uh, the blocks can be put into a tree where A dominates B only if A is B's ancestor in the tree. So here we have a simple program and an, exa an example of its corresponding dominance tree on the right hand side. Um, the key theorem which makes SSA based register allocation possible is that the live range of an SSA value, that is the places where it is live, forms the subtree of this tree which is rooted at the definition. So for example here, we have the live range of V1 and you can see uh, that it is a subtree of the entire dominance tree on the right hand side. Okay, so now that we've gone over this theory, we can get back to our allocator. We're gonna extend the previous algorithm by just visiting each block and running the previous algorithm inside the block. But we have to visit these blocks in the so-called dominance order, meaning that we have to visit each block before we visit the block it's blocks it dominates. Uh, most common block orders, such as the source code order in NUR with uh, structured control flow, already satisfy this, so it's not going to be that hard to do this. Um, if we follow dominance order, then we're going to be guaranteed that each live in value will be assigned to a register by the time we visit the block, because its definition has to dominate the block due to the whole tree property. Uh, and furthermore, for any two live in values, then one must dominate the other, which means that the first one must have been live during the definition of the second one that it dominates. So they must have been assigned separate registers. This means that each live in value has a unique register um, and that we have a valid assignment of values to registers at the start of each block. So all we then have to do is set up the available set rather than just assuming that everything is available at the beginning like we did before, and we can reuse the core of the previous algorithm. Okay, so this allocator works and it's still optimal in that the sense that it uses the minimum number of registers possible, but we still have to deal with fee nodes. Uh, one key thing that you have to understand about fee nodes is that they happen in parallel. That because the source of each phenote is read at the end of the predecessor block, 
and then copied to the destinations in parallel at the start of the successor basic block. This means that sometimes we have to swap two registers to resolve a fee node, as, we, as we'll see later. So let's look at an example to see what this means in practice. So here we have an example program that I pulled from one of the SSA papers. Uh, and the results after SSA construction and very simple copy propagation. Um, because D is only used in the if, and we only have three values in the first place, uh, it's, uh, sorry, because D is only used in the if, it doesn't conflict with E. Because we only have three values in the first place, um, the register pressure is never more than two. So let's assume that our processor uh, has only two registers, that is, we'll set n equals two for simplicity. If we run our algorithm on this, then what do we get? Um, so this is a one possible register assignment for the previous program. Uh, along the if branch, r0 is copied to r0, and r1 is copied to r1. So we don't have to do anything. We don't have to insert any code. However, along the else branch, r1 is copied to r0, and r0 is copied to r1 at the same time, because the fee nodes, again, have to happen in parallel. This means that we have to swap r0 and r1 when coming from the else block. Uh, since we don't have any extra registers available, we have to do the swap. In fact, and in fact, it's an impossible to find an allocation for this program that doesn't involve swapping the two registers in place. Um, so this shows that, in general, it's impossible to avoid this sort of swapping if we want to use the minimum number of registers possible and know ahead of time how many registers we need. So how do we handle these swaps? Um, sometimes uh, the hardware has a swap instruction that's already available and just does exactly what we want, or we can use some sort of trick to construct it. But on targets that aren't so fortunate, we need to find an available spare register. Uh, for example, by running liveness analysis on the already register allocated program again and fall back to something like this XOR trick when we run out of registers. Again, I'm not going to describe how this works. Um, you can easily find a lot of explanations on the internet about this XOR trick. But um, it's good to know that we have it in the back of our pocket in case the hardware doesn't help us. OK, so now that we've worked through that one small example, let's talk about how it works in general. First off, uh, it's important to note that when inserting code to resolve a fee node, we have to be mindful of the fact that fee nodes are supposed to happen along the control flow edge. Um, if the predecessor block of the fee node that we're interested in only has one successor, then it's not a problem because code inserted along the edge for this fee node can be moved up to the predecessor without changing anything. However, if the predecessor has other successors than the one containing the fee node, any code inserted at the end will also happen along those other edges, and it might break things. So if there is a so-called critical edge like this, then the usual solution is to just insert an empty block that can contain our fix-up code. All right. So in order to handle more complicated cases than just a single swap, we need to create this so-called transfer graph. Um, the nodes of the graph are the physical registers, and the edges are the copies. We then resolve the graph piece by piece, inserting copies until there are only cycles left, and then inserting swaps to resolve the cycles. Um, the overall algorithm is pretty similar to the algorithm in this paper um, for resolving parallel copies when doing SSA deconstruction before register allocation. Um, so I'm not going to describe it too much further. Um, now, while we can't avoid inserting these copies and swaps, we would like to avoid inserting them whenever possible. To do this, uh, we have to add affinities to fee nodes, meaning that we try to assign the same register for their arguments and destination. Uh, then the pick physreg function in our pseudocode has to consider these affinities to avoid creating too many instructions when resolving fee nodes. Can't always find the optimal allocation, of course, because as Daniel mentioned, that's NP hard. Um, but we can do much better than a naive pick phys, pick, pick phys implementation. All right. So to recap, we've talked about how SSA-based register allocation works on an architecture with a perfectly registered reg register file where each value can be assigned to any physical registers, no physical physical registers overlap, and anything everything is unicorns and rainbows. Um, this is more or less what was in the original SSA-based register allocation paper. 
Um, but in the real world, things are never so simple, unfortunately. Um, and also, there's no one-size-fits-all one solution to getting SSA-based register allocation to work on an arbitrarily complex register file. However, using what's called live frame splitting, we can extend it to handle most features of different targets. Uh, we're going to focus on one feature, relatively common to GPU architectures, but most of the ideas and the basic framework here can be reused for other features. All right. So um, the feature I'm going to talk about here is vector registers. Most GPUs have some instructions which operate on sequences of registers rather than a single one. Uh, usually, these are load and store instructions. Uh, we're going to assume that these instructions can take any register as a base and load and store the series of registers after that. Uh, but we're not going to allow wraparound uh, because most architectures don't allow that. So you can't load from our, the last register in the first one, something like that. Um, and so we're going to extend our toy architecture to add vector load and store instructions, and then I'm going to explain how to extend all, how to explain how to extend SSA based register allocation to handle that. Okay, so the first question is, how do we model these vector registers in SSA? I'm going to add two pseudo instructions um, similar to fee nodes called split and collect, or uh, in ACO they're called split vector and create vector. Uh, collect, sorry, split vector and create vector, yeah. Collect takes n scalar registers and produces an n sized vector register. Split does the exact opposite. It takes an n sized vector register and splits it into n scalar registers. Uh, both of these instructions are essentially equivalent to a series of parallel copies, so we can handle them just like any other instruction. And then after register allocation, um, we can be lower them to copies and swaps using the same transfer technique as we saw for fee nodes. Again, similar to fee nodes, we're going to add affinities for these instructions to try to avoid inserting copies for them whenever possible. Okay, so how many registers? Here's the problem though. How many registers will we need when allocating this program? It should be clear that, we, first off, we need to update our definition of register pressure, since values can now take up more than one register. Uh, instead of the number of live values, the register pressure is now the total number of live vector components. Um, and with that upda updated definition, we can see that this program has a maximum register pressure of three at the beginning, with the load and the split there. Uh, so what happens when we try to allocate this program using only three registers. OK, so this is the result uh, of, of that. Um, so we can successfully allocate the first four instructions, but then when allocating before, we run into a problem. Uh, at this point of the program, there are two spaces available in the register file, but they aren't contiguous. So we don't have enough space to allocate before. Uh, what can we do about this? Okay, cool. Went back. Uh, so the solution to is insert a copy before the instruction to shuffle the registers to make space for V4. There are two possible ways to do this. Uh, if we want to preserve the SSA form after register allocation, then we can create a new SSA value and rewrite the uses of V4 after load instruction to refer to this new value. If not, then we can insert a non-SSA copy, like we see here with the R2 equals R1, and have any uses of V4 contain a different register than the definition. Uh, ACO uses the first approach, and IR3 uses the second approach. Uh, so unfortunately, um, with our architecture, where uh, vector registers can start at any base, it can be really difficult to find an optimal shuffle, meaning that one that uses the minimum number of copies uh, so, for example, in this worst case scenario, um, there's one empty space at the beginning, followed by a bunch of two component values, which fill up the entire register file, followed by a single empty space at the end. Um, there isn't a single scalar value that we can move around to make space next to one of the empty values, which means that we have to shuffle around the entire register file. Um, both ACO and IR3 use uh, heuristics to try to use less copies when possible, but there's no register. If there's no alignment for vector registers, then in the end, 
you need a fallback that can handle this case. Um, but fortunately, this sort of thing does not come off very often as one might imagine. Okay, so that's all I'm gonna say about live range splitting um, here. I don't have enough time to describe it more in detail. Um, but how does this interact with control flow? Um, so for example, in here, we have a value v1, which is defined for the if and then used after the if. And let's say that it's split, we split its live range uh, in the then branch. Um, that means that after the then branch and the else branch, it's in two different registers. So we have a problem here. Um, without live range splitting, without live range splitting, each definition gets exactly one register. But as soon as we introduce live range splits, this assumption doesn't hold anymore. So if the control, when the control flow merges, those two register allocations have to be merged again um, by inserting new fee nodes. And those fee nodes can either be uh, actual SSA, similar to the parallel copy instructions, those can be actual SSA values or they can contain just physical registers. Uh, okay. I'll go back to Daniel for the conclusion. Yeah, as you could see, although the idea of the SSA-based register allocation um, is quite simple, the actual implementation has a few more things to take care of. So yeah, then it in the end becomes rather complex. Um, and we can also already note that on SSA-based register allocation, the quality of the code um, only depends on the ability to avoid these live range splits and also to um, assign the same register to fee definitions and the fee sources. So it's only a question about how many copies do I need for the allocation. Um, yeah, I know this talk was now pretty fast and dense. So for those who are interested in more details about it and how to actually um, do in detail single steps of this algorithm, um, and if, or if you have more ideas to try and uh, stuff like that, then we would like to invite you tomorrow to the workshop at 16.35. And yeah, that was it so far from our side, but... Um, yeah, now we have a couple of minutes for questions. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so far. <laughs> thank you very much for your question, for your talk. And now it's time for some questions from IRC. Although the talk was very intensive, so it might be that some people need a bit more time to process all of that. Okay, let's wait for a few more seconds for any questions coming in. <laughs> okay, Eric Nunes asks, if this is implemented in MISA, is it done in a way that can be easily reused by other MISA drivers? Uh, that's a good question and a tough one. And I mentioned, I did touch on that a bit when I said that there's no one size fits all solution for um, handling different register files. Um, there might be something to be shared with the whole um, uh, liveness, uh, but in order to do that, you have to more tightly couple um, the, the, because the, the, this algorithm is way more tightly coupled to the IR than, for example, um, graph-based register coloring that uh, can be, you can build this graph data structure and then just sort of hand it off to another algorithm. <laughs> Um, so we don't have any easier answers for that, and that's part of the reason why uh, IR3 register allocating, register allocation is like a completely separate thing. Fire asks, how hard is it to add optimal spilling to this approach? Um, I think optimal spilling by itself is another NP-hard problem, but um, 
I then, think when it's just when there's no control flow, you can do the optimal thing. <laughs> okay, but because the um, you can use that last least recently used. Uh, yeah. So the, the point that? is by separating spilling and register allocation, it is possible to use way better heuristics than just uh, like in the traditional register allocation. You basically run into oh i have no registers anymore what should i do or which variables should i spill while um, when doing the spilling before register location you can you basically analyze the program and see which parts need um need need more registers than are available and spill around it so i think that you can do much better even with kind of simple oh. heuristics than than what is done in the traditional register location. Yeah, it's definitely way better. Um, and I think, yeah, this they, people were using that technique even before um, with like graphical and register allocators, but then you still might need to spill during register allocation. Uh, you know. But um, you can do it kind of perfectly with SSA-based register allocation. And you can also avoid it in 99% of the cases. Well, then a yeah. bit depends on your architecture and how many registers are relevant, stuff like that, but yeah. Okay, that looks like that was the last question. Thank you very much to Connor Abbott and Daniel Sherman for this talk. And if you're interested in hearing more, there is a workshop tomorrow. Check out the schedule and well, have a great conference. Thank you very much. All right, thank thanks. you. Goodbye.